Welcome to Spectrum Sundays. I am Francesca D'Alessandro, serving my community through AAA Appreciation and Awareness for Autism. I am also a speech language pathologist with a master's degree from the University at Buffalo. And I am Megan Sinisi, Miss Pennsylvania 2021 and the founder of a nonprofit organization for autism titled From a New Perspective. I am also a speech language pathologist with a master's degree from the University of Missouri. Everyone deserves to feel accepted and included in every space that they walk in. Our series aims to inspire you to advocate for yourself and on behalf of your loved ones. And we are so grateful that you're here with us today. Macy Sotantio is an openly autistic advocate and inclusivity trainer. In 2019, Macy started the nonprofit Autism Career Pathways with a mission to increase hiring and long-term retention rates for autistic individuals seeking careers in all types of businesses. Macy also believes that autistic individuals can redefine meaningful employment as small business owners. As a family coach, Macy helps to empower parents to take, to take back their role as competent individuals capable of guiding their autistic loved one within their own family and culture. After her own autism and sensory processing disorder diagnoses, she now shares her lived experiences to help parents support, accommodate, and advocate from a place of compassion and positive mindset. With her master's degree in curriculum and instructional design, she aspires to develop vocational and adaptive living curriculum for teens and adults with neurological differences. Her goal is to create resources for educators, professionals, job coaches, and business owners from all over the world to hire and support neurodivergent individuals in a variety of workplaces. Thank you for having me. Thank okay. you for being with us. Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, so now I get to introduce myself, yes. right? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> We're waiting for all of us. Right. I'm waiting for my prompt. So, okay. So my name is Macy Satantio and I am a longtime autistic parent coach. Um, at our clinic, my husband and I um, work together. My husband works with all the dads and I, I work. I'm the one doing all the school related stuff with IEPs and all that, but I'm very lucky to be in this space for over 30 years. And my job is basically translating autistic experiences to parents and help parents really understand, you know, what is their uh, true authentic autistic identity for their autistic fa uh, family member and help parents to go with it. Uh, so I, um, I love uh, teaching and guiding parents about nurturing special interests. So my long time, since forever, special interest is uh, sports watching, not doing sports, sports watching, <laughs> because that's something that how I connected with my dad. Uh, and that has helped me a lot, actually, to understand and decode human communication and relationship, all just from like watching a lot of sports. Uh, so today uh, I teach online classes about nurturing specialized interests um, in autistic children. And I think it's really, really important for actually for everyone to have that special interest. Uh, yeah, so um, I think that's that's good amount <laughs> of uh, information, right? Yes. Well, okay. thank you so much for being with us, Macy. We learned so mm -hmm. much from you in our previous episode that focused a lot on the employment opportunities for those that are neurodivergent. But you touched in your little introduction to us this week that you really work hand in hand with parents to mm -hmm. help them be better advocates through the lens of understanding what it is that their autistic child experiences and what they think yeah. and what they want for their own life. And that's just amazing. So we, we are really looking forward to digging deeper into all the advocacy work that you do through Autism Career Pathways. But you previously mentioned to us that 
there's a disconnect between educational and therapeutic goals when ser- servicing neurodivergent children. So could you elaborate mm-hmm. on what that disconnect is and how we can tackle this issue as a community? Yeah, well, when you think about it, when a little child receives a diagnosis, it doesn't have to be autism. You know, Once that label is given uh, to the child, and I think the, the life of this child is forever changing because parents are given a report uh, with a list of recommended therapies or to-do lists, uh, you know, in the back of it. And um, parents immediately felt like, okay, you know, in order for me to be a good parent, I have to be able to do these things that are list on this list, right? So that's number one. And um, also then um, I think uh, when you think about this child's life, then it just dramatically changes from being a kid to being a client in therapy like different kinds of therapy. Now, I'm not saying that therapies are not needed, not at all, you know, but I think it's when it comes to allowing a child to grow up in a safe home environment and also continuing to nurture the parent-child relationship and, um, parents learning to become the parent they always want to be and can be, all of that is lost the moment a diagnosis is given, right? So it becomes like, uh, it's almost like you become the manager or you you have to make more money to be able to afford these therapies. Uh, You know, your, your own definition of like, a good parent, a good mom, a good dad changes like after a diagnosis because you are in you are in this crisis crisis mindset because a professional tells you like, oh, there's this window. <laughs> if your child doesn't talk by the time he or she's five years old, then it's all doomsday, you know? So you're, you feel like you're rushing against time and you're forgetting a child is a child. And a mom is a mom. A mom knows a lot more than what professionals, um, you, you know, can ever like know. Like that, that bond is very, very strong, right? So, so I think when you think about that, in itself, you know, from the child's point of view, how, what a significant life change that is the moment a label is given to you, right? Now, when you think about services, therapies and educational services and so on that are not then added into your life as a little kid, it's also all based on a deficit model or a medical model, right? where if you hand flaps, you're then, it would be a goal to replace that hand flapping with something much more appropriate. And it depends on who sets that goal. That's just an example where we know for autistic people, stimming is like breathing air. It's like dancing to music that you like, you know, Uh, we need to stim in order to be able to express ourselves, to self-regulate and so on. Now, I'm not saying that all stims are uh, great. Some stims do, it's hurtful to the child or to other people that's different, but there are hopefully um, occupational therapists who can advise parents and so on. So again, taking the child's perspective and how from such a a young age, that person then grows up thinking that I need to be someone else, right? And and I see how it affects the ability to self-advocate 
because you don't really know who you are. You're always being told by someone else, well, you should say this, you should do this. You should sit first before I show you the pictures, for example, you know, and there are just a ton of other examples, you know, and so you don't really know who you are actually. And I really believe this is why it, employment is very difficult because when you're out there in the real world with other people who don't know you, you have to know how to ask for help. You know, and I think neurodivergent children are not being empowered to speak up, you know, and even for me as an, as a late diagnosed autistic adult, I'm still learning to unpack, like really digging deep and really um, learning how to protect myself, how to self-advocate, how to, you know, like all this stuff that I was not aware, you know, so people don't know what I'm don't, people don't know what they don't know. So this is um, what I hope maybe in the next five years, it will be different. But right now we don't have any training curriculum for professionals that are not based on a deficit medical model. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I mean. It's just, it's not just teaching skills. It's really restructuring yeah. the whole like lifespan of how we uh, define neurodivergence. Right. And yeah. uh, if I could add on to that too, everything you're saying really resonates with me because I worked in a school for a little while and I noticed a lot of the times the goals would say uh, maintaining eye contact, conversational volleys and whatnot. But I noticed in these students, there were actually different goals and skills that they needed to work on, such as being able to advocate and understand what they had been diagnosed with because they didn't they didn't know how to verbally express their differences with another person or um, so that therefore their self esteem was reflected in that and. Um, and I just felt like those things needed to be advocated more. Um, so I'm really glad that you explained your approach and your perspective on that, because I think that is how we are going to shift and really help encourage those who are neurodivergent because they stutter or because they're on the spectrum or whatever it might be so that they feel more comfortable and more successful in whichever space that they are in. Um, and so yeah. when, oh, go ahead, sorry. I, I was just going to say, when you think about it, uh, for autistic adults uh, that are my age, when we were little, uh, we didn't have any therapy choices. We just had our parents, right? I just ha I remember very clearly my mom sitting down with me after work, teaching me to read because I was a slow reader. I gave my mom full credit to be the one finally figuring out how to teach her daughter to read because I didn't learn that in school. I also have number dyslexia or dyscalculia. And it, it's something that to today, like uh, math, when it comes to numbers, math, time concepts, um, I'm trash. <laughs> like I just, I'm horrible. It just doesn't make any sense. I've never balanced my checkbook, you know, this and that. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, I only had my parents to help me, you know, and when I failed in school and all of my math subjects, I could hide it from my friends, but I couldn't hide it from my parents. But I guess my parents were a bit different because they really celebrate my efforts. And it doesn't matter if I got a C minus or, you know, that they were a bit different that way and this is what something that I want to tell all the parents like you can do this because you see your kid you know and um, um, yeah like little progress is worth celebrating 
Yes, I completely agree. And yeah. I think a lot of feedback I get from parents too is they're afraid of their child's future in right, what right. that will look like, but that's ever changing. So when neurodivergent teenagers and adults come to you for help um, mm -hmm. because of the services and accommodations that were once available in childhood are not mm -hmm. gonna be appropriate once they're graduated and yeah. going to college or working, yeah. so what are ways that the rest of the community can better accommodate neurodivergent individuals mm -hmm. um, in yeah. whichever way you think has helped yeah. the most? Right forget the age appropriateness, you know, forget all this, this, this expectations that when you are this age, you need to behave like this, you know, if you come from this culture, you should behave like this, you know, and so on, like all of these set expectations, because you're missing out. <laughs> if that's, that's what you're looking for, you're missing out, really, because when there's nothing like finding a mentor who you feel get you, like who is your game changer? You know, my mom was my game changer and she did the best that she could have. It was really hard for her, I'm sure, because we had multiple neurodivergent people in my family. You know, it was really hard, but she did the best that she could. But what I'm remembering today as a parent myself is the way she was with me will always be the way that uh, would be my best practices with my own kids, you know? So it, it's just, you just have to really understand we're getting to know another human being and you always have to presume competence. It may not be today, but you always have to be there to support a person to, to get started. You have to start somewhere. Will you be that person who communicates that, hey, I believe in you? You know what I mean? I think the sad things also for parents, they forget to tell their children, I believe in you. If today you can only put on one shoe <laughs> instead of both pair of your shoes, that's good enough for me today, because I know today you're having a hard time. Right. You and know, like, and like you said before, it's, it's so necessary to celebrate yeah. small successes. Yeah. And I feel like that's something, Fran, you mentioned a little bit yeah. with setting goals that you're yeah. looking for a certain level of success that may only right. be attainable for a certain type of brain, right. or a person right. thinks a certain type of way. Right. So success can look very different because it's individualized for each person. So absolutely choose goals based on what we think our clients can mm -hmm. achieve. Yeah. So something that's within the realm of possibility for them. What does success right. mean to you and your clients? And how do you keep mm -hmm. them encouraged on that path mm -hmm. of reaching their success? I think that a big thing is if, if my clients can uh, transform themselves from I can't do it to, I know I can do this. That would be huge, right? And also for them to know that my good enough is, it's so important for me to say, that's my good enough today, you know? So the struggle to stay on task, to be able to know that, Today, you can only do two out of five things that you set to do, but you can celebrate that two out of five things. It's huge because you know that's your best for that day. And you I'm know. laughing to myself a little bit because Megan and I actually just had this conversation a few days ago yeah. where I think this lesson really applies to, yeah, to anyone, anyone Yes, where we just need to be more accepting of mm -hmm. who we are and what we bring to the table and how much we can handle at any given time. And as long mm -hmm. as we know that we're doing our best, even if we fall short of our original goals right. and plans, mm -hmm. That's all we can give. And then yeah. we just reset the next day. And it's not yeah. as serious yeah. as it seems. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, so so I think the other thing I want to say also is that when parents begin to shift from a deficit model themselves, then they can self-advocate uh, differently. 
um, in IEP meetings, when they work with other professionals, that's so important, right? Because if you're a speech therapist, you don't, um, you don't necessarily see how the interactions actually happens at home and parents still need your guidance. So when parents can self-advocate better, then everyone can be on the same wavelength, wavelength better. You know what I mean? So I think that's important. So when parents can self-advocate differently, that also the byproduct of that is that your children can also be empowered to self-advocate for according to themselves. Like I know that I am very light, sen light smell, sound sensitive. There's nothing I can do to change that because I live in this world you know, and um, I have chronic, chronic migraines, I have all these health issues. There's nothing I can do about that. But um, I know how to self advocate, I know how to problem solve. So this is a message that I always tell my parents, the parents that I work with, like, you can't fix the problem, you can't take away the bullies at school, you can't, you just have to make sure that your child feel if something happens at school, you know, I can always tell my mom, like first thing, you know, and not be punished twice. You know, if I have headache, I can turn off the lights and work in the dark, you know? So, so empowering our kids to be able to understand who they are first and problem solve it. So I always tell parents, don't problem solve it for your kids because then they still don't know how to self-advocate. <laughs> When they're right. alone. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great point. Yeah. And yeah. for parents or neurodivergent individuals or even employers to connect mm -hmm. and get more resources and knowledge, what yeah. organizations or resources would you like, uh, would you recommend? So I think it's very important to listen to autistic and neurodivergent adults. And I know that right now, online, um, the community can be very divided, right? The autism community and the autistic community. Uh, what I can say is that uh, autistic adults feel very passionate about advocating on behalf of autistic children um, because we are very worried of the future uh, of autistic children. So a lot of times we don't know how to explain things, uh, especially in a written format, it's very difficult. But uh, I always tell parents of a newly diagnosed child, just choose a few, if you're on Facebook, choose a few Facebook groups that you feel like, okay, this is good information for our family, not just for you, not just for your child, for my family, because you grow together as a family, right? You, it's not about fixing your child. You are part of that story, right? You have to write your family story together. It's about being together. So this is how you protect yourself from all that noise online. It's too much noise. My mom didn't have that and that was a blessing, I think. Um, yeah, so a couple of my favorite online group, uh, Asan, um, here, that's a local company here, actually, a local organ nonprofit in my area. Um, they're great. Neuroclastic is fabulous. I love how they include all kinds of autistic people, including non-speaking autistic advocates. They're awesome. Uh, autism Career Pathways, of course, if you're interested in like learning about care career readiness, um, that's us. Uh, and we include the families as part of that career readiness journey. <laughs> and um, let's see, let me think about other. Reframing Autism is great. They're on Facebook. Some organizations are on Facebook or Instagram. But I'm trying to think of the ones. Yeah, so Reframing Autism is great. Um, and if you have a young child, Nurturing Neurodiversity is another great close Facebook group. So all of these Facebook groups, they're close, right? 
Nurturing Neurodiversity is close also, and I'm one of the moderators. There are autistic adults in there, and it's very well moderated. So if you are therapists and professionals, I recommend on Facebook another close group called Neurodiversity Affirmative Therapists. So for you both, that's a really good group, very well moderated. Um, yeah, I think that's probably enough. That's a lot. Those already. are some great starts. And I like how you yeah. disclosed which ones were closed and really what that means to anyone yeah. who might not understand. Um, yeah. Usually there's a set of requirements to get into those groups to view the posts. Mm -hmm. um, you either have to be self-diagnosed or diagnosed with a, a specific mm -hmm. disorder, depending on the group, yeah. uh, just because they do want to keep it somewhat private. So that's what yes. closed means. But like you said, right. there's others that are not closed that are still available to the public. Right. And we really appreciated your time here, but we're going to sure. switch gears and do a rapid fire round, which is oh, no. more, <laughs> it's a light and fun segment for our audience to get to know you okay. a little bit better. So you mentioned a little bit about your, uh, what you're passionate about in your intro earlier, but okay. This is another way for our, our viewers to get to know you as well. Mm -hmm. So you can just answer with one or two words. You don't have to. You can explain as much in depth as you want. But the first question is, mm -hmm. are you an early riser or a night owl? Uh, night owl, mostly. <laughs> yeah. I think all three of us might be a night owl in this yeah. group. Yeah, <laughs> that's where I, I watch my bing, binge watch my Netflix stuff or watch basketball, you know, so I, I'm a basketball uh, fan. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Okay. So follow up to that. Uh, what, what show are you binge watching or what's a favorite book or podcast that you have at the moment? Okay. So right now I am watching on Netflix, this Russian <laughs> series called better than us, which is very interesting. It's about robots. Um, mm. I, I, yeah. So it's, it's actually, I think it's pretty good. And then there is another uh, movie that we watch is called Finch with Tom Hanks. And that's another one with robot about a robot, and but it's very it's it's great. You guys have to watch it. That one's on Apple TV, I think, if you have access to that. But uh, it well, it, there's the word autism is mentioned in there because the robot is very literal. Okay. So the same as in Better Than Us, the robot, uh, the robots are all very you know not. Yes, literal. Well, so maybe I'll definitely that's why. Look into yeah. It. Yeah. The thing. <laughs> yes. So. <laughs> okay. So, what is your favorite, or where is your favorite place to visit in California? Um, that's a good question. You know, San Francisco is still. I know I live just maybe down not too far, but uh, San Francisco is beautiful. It's just such a unique place. Have you been to San Francisco? Oh, you have to visit. It, it's such a beautiful city, the amazing vibe in different parts of the city has different vibes, you know. So if you ever, you know, uh, are here, definitely count me in as your guide. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we'll yeah. keep that in mind. We're over on the East Coast, so I know that right. My brother had had a chance to go to San Francisco and he really loved it. Um, it's it's just so beautiful. Yeah. What is your favorite holiday every year? Oh my gosh, that's a good uh, uh, Mother's Day. <laughs> Mother's Day, because I can actually tell everyone, okay, I'm not your mom for the day. <laughs> go, go to dad. You get spoiled for the day. You get a little relief from the job. Yeah. Like, mother. I'm not here. <laughs> yeah. And who would you like to give a special shout out to today? Oh my gosh. Um, so many people. Well, through this campaign that we're doing, Autistic Makers, um, there's so many like Autistic Makers. I just want to tell all of them, you know, believe in yourself, believe in your creations and just get started, get started. 
That's amazing. Yeah. Well, we really enjoyed our time together once again. Thank you so much for visiting with us on Spectrum Sundays. And if you enjoyed this episode and would like to connect with her more for support, you can check out her Instagram pages at Macy Sotantio for support for parenting and autism career pathways for neurodivergent employability, employability and inclusivity consulting. Additionally, check out her website, www.autismcareerpathways.org. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you next Sunday. Thank you for listening to Spectrum Sundays. We are your hosts, Francesca D'Alessandro and Miss Pennsylvania, Megan Sinisi. Please make sure to subscribe to our series and follow us on social media to stay connected to autism professionals and self-advocates. And remember, true impact is accomplished through active listening and exploring the world through a variety of perspectives. Join us next week on Spectrum Sundays to help cultivate a community of inclusion, appreciation, and acceptance around autism.